Hey guys, welcome back to Intelligent Faith 315. This is Pastor Jay. Glad to be with you today. Uh, this is uh, my fourth video response. Um, actually, it's my third video response. Um, my fourth verbal response to the folks who have chosen to make videos in response to the video I posted entitled 18 Questions for My uh, Atheist Friends. This particular response is going to be going out to Bionic Dance. Uh, that was the longest response that was made, and it was, you know, the most colorful, the most high-tech, and so forth. So this response is for you, Bionic Dance. Hopefully you'll uh, receive it, pick up on it, and encourage, I encourage you that we could just do some dialogue back and forth. Um, didn't seem like you liked me too much, you know, in that video, which I understand, but if you're willing to, love to keep dialoguing back and forth. Um, or you could pass it on to some of your other atheist friends as well. I'd love to speak with them too. Let me just start off by saying um, that I really thought that your video was well done. You've got better editing techniques and effects uh, than I do uh, by far. My videos are very plain. Um, I don't have a lot of time to be manipulating and uh, apparently don't know as much about it as you do. You must have a good team or, or you know have good editing skills yourself. But so your videos are really interesting. Uh, you have a really colorful personality. Uh, you seem like an interesting person. So I take my hat off to you in that regard. Your videos are really well done. Got that cool intro, the cool outro. Uh, I could learn a lot from your video editing skills there. So I appreciate that. And also, I just really appreciate the fact, Bionic Dance, that you made a, a video response in general. There were over 1,300 views on that video that I made, the 18 questions. And out of the over 1,300 responses, only four responses were made in return to me. And you were one of those four, and you were the longest and the most in-depth. And you also sought to answer the most questions. So I really appreciate that. So without further delay here, let me just launch into some of the observations that I made on your uh, on your comments, and we'll just start to go through them together. All right. Well, if I was going to give a title to your video, Bionic Dance, I honestly would say that the video title should probably be called I Don't Know, because that did seem to be one of the major focuses of your video, and uh, you seem to me to be more of an agnostic than an atheist. I spoke to another friend of mine, and he claims to be an atheist and an agnostic, um, and they, they really do happen to be mutually exclusive. Um, either you don't know or you do know. So the claim of atheism is a positive knowledge claim, and the claim of agnosticism uh, is either a positive claim that we absolutely cannot know, or it's just kind of a soft claim that uh, I'm just not really sure about it. So I would say that you know your video could be retitled like that because that seemed to be the most frequent response that you gave was that you don't know. So to me, uh, you do really seem to be uh, a really, really strong agnostic. Uh, but anyway, let's just launch into what you said here. You said that I don't know is uh, the theist's greatest fear. Um, that's just not true. Uh, theists, um, we say I don't know uh, quite as often as anybody else does. Uh, the reason for that is because saying I don't know stimulates investigation, uh, whether it's philosophical or scientific investigation, and leads to a search for truth and evidence and for answers. So I have absolutely no problem saying that I don't know. There's lots of things I don't know. Uh, the only being that I know who has infinite knowledge and absolute knowledge is God. Um, so all of us should be comfortable with saying that, and I certainly uh, don't think that. I do think that my worldview has more answers than any other one, not because it's mine, um, but I subscribe to it for that very reason, because it does have more answers, more cohesive and cogent and persuasive answers than any other worldview. I really do think the Christian worldview takes the cake uh, in the marketplace of ideas, it has a greater explanatory power and explanatory scope than any other worldview. So we're not afraid of saying, I don't know. Um, you said my definition of a worldview was wrong, and you tried to back that up at Wikipedia. And I just think that uh, you're, you're just sadly mistaken. The, the word worldview comes from a German word, Weltanschauung, which is a couple hundred years old. And uh, I wouldn't be getting my information from Wikipedia. There's definitely a lot more authoritative sources than that. Wikipedia, as I'm sure you know, can be altered by just anybody coming in there and altering the articles and so forth. So I would not be looking to Wikipedia for that. Uh, anyways, uh, the worldview um, is precisely that, a view of the world. And it has to do with a person's overall intellectual framework through which they interpret reality. And this would include issues like you mentioned. Uh, ethics, morality, origin, etc. So atheism is definitely a worldview. Uh, you said that origins isn't a part of that. That's just simply not true. Origin is one of the major questions that must be answered by worldview. Uh, I, I would encourage you, I don't know where you're reading currently about worldview, uh, but 
I would do some more reading about that. Uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. I do have it in my house, um, the secular book, the uh, Cambridge Dictionary of – it's either Cambridge or Ox Oxford Dictionary of Philosophy. And uh, Weltanschauung and worldview is listed in there. So I'd encourage you to kind of expand your understanding of a worldview because that's, that's really not true. You said atheism is not a worldview, and that also is, is false. Uh, if a worldview is a view of reality – a, a comprehensive view of reality, then atheism, of course, is a worldview. Some people do try to say that. What they're really trying to do is they're trying to repackage the word agnosticism and claim that it's atheism. And you can't do that. You have to make a choice. Either you're making a positive claim to know, which is atheism. You'd say positive true truth claim that there is no God. That's what atheism is. It's not just a, it's not just a, a lack of belief in God, that, that is agnosticism repackaged, and it's, it's being intellectually dishonest and misinformed, I think. Uh, but atheism, according to, as I said, the uh, Cambridge Dictionary of Philosophy is the positive truth claim, the positive belief that there is no God. And therefore, if it's a positive belief, a positive truth claim, you must give evidence supporting your belief. You carry the burden of proof, and you need to back up that positive truth claim. So that's what atheism actually is. And you said that it doesn't involve morality or ethics, and my friend, that's a major part of any worldview is morality and ethics, not to mention origin, metaphysics, logic, etc. You also went on to say that faith is belief without evidence, and it's fairy tales and myths. Um, well, you're just misinformed, unfortunately, and I don't blame you because even a lot of Christians will say that. Maybe that's why you've been taught that. But faith is not a lack of evidence. Faith is trusting into the evidence and into experience. So faith is trusting not what we don't know. Faith is actually trusting what we do know to be true. It's just like a person. A person that you know is a person that you trust, and it's like that. And so God reveals himself and manifests himself, leaves many different aspects of evidence to himself, and based upon that evidence, then you trust into this being, this person, uh, into God. And you also said that uh, Christianity and faith and so forth are a bunch of fairy tales and myths. Uh, I know that's a really common conception, but it's just really uninformed, and it's actually uh, unacademic. Um, even your atheist comrades who don't obviously have a belief in God or in the Christian worldview, they know that it's not a bunch of fairy tales and myths. They know that uh, it is based upon certain historical facts. So I do encourage you to do some research yourself about the historical evidence and facts surrounding the Old Testament and New Testament, particularly the historical facts surrounding the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, and by the way, there's over 17 non-Christian historical sources that testify to the life, ministry, death, and following of Jesus of Nazareth. 17 non-Christian sources. And I can give you that information if you'd like. Everybody from Tacitus to Suetonius to Josephus, uh, two Roman emperors, uh, multiple individuals. So the historical facts, archaeological evidence of the Old and New Testament, absolutely tremendous, unparalleled in any uh, document, ancient or new. Also, the Old Testament predictions, we call these prophecies. We have the Old Testament manuscripts. There's, there's hundreds and hundreds of Old Testament predictions that have been literally uh, fulfilled in every detail. And among those predictions is a group of predictions about Messiah, and we call this Messianic prophecy. And I'd encourage you to do some, some research into that. Um, if any of those are true, it really does provide some incredible evidence for the truth of these ancient manuscripts and also... Uh, for God's existence because, of course, there's no naturalistic explanation as to how you could predict uh, where a man such as Jesus would be born, how many pieces of silver he'd be betrayed for, uh, how crucifixion would be his method of execution before it even existed, etc. So do some research into the historical evidence, archaeological, Old Testament predictions, and then the scientific statements of Scripture, which are way before their time, and even philosophical statements that are absolutely consistent and logical. You go on to say that religion doesn't operate on facts. Again, you're just misinformed because at least the Christian religion, the Christian worldview, is testable, is verifiable. Paul the Apostle and many other people say that if, if the facts don't line up with Christianity, uh, for example, with the historical facts of Jesus demonstrating the resurrection, then we of all men are most foolish. And so I, I do encourage you to investigate that, that the Christian worldview is uniquely testable and verifiable because it is based upon facts, facts of history, um, etc. So faith is trusting in the facts. The Christian worldview doesn't explain anything. Again, that just seems to me to be totally confused because if the Christian worldview is true, 
it really would explain a lot of things. For example, it would explain the origin of the universe, the contingency of the universe, design of the universe, morality in the universe, the origin of concepts and ideas. It would explain the historical facts of the Old Testament and New Testament. It would explain the, the reality of the human condition, why we are evil and sinful. It would explain origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. And it would explain certain features of the universe that we really do believe in that they exist. Love, beauty, justice, etc. So the Christian worldview does explain a tremendous deal. As a matter of fact, I think it explains more than any other worldview. It has the broadest explanatory power and deepest explanatory scope. And it explains more features of our experience than anything else. That's why I actually subscribe to it. And that's why after my own investigation of two years, that's why I have committed myself to the person of Jesus Christ and uh, wholeheartedly believe that the Christian worldview is the most superior worldview that there is because it does explain so much. Uh, you, you say the Christian worldview is a wrong answer, but then you don't go on to tell me how. I, I would appreciate you telling me how it's a wrong answer, why it's a wrong answer, and give me a detailed you know, kind of an explanation as to why that's the case. That, of course, is the whole uh, purpose of, of a dialogue. And then you said we need to learn to accept what we don't know. Uh, we do. There's lots of situations that we do accept what we don't know. We don't have infinite knowledge at all. But, of course, we don't always want to stay in that state of ignorance. We want to strive after truth and strive after evidence and knowledge and answers because otherwise we'd be stuck with just dead agnosticism, and that's not going to do anybody any good. So um, we are stimulated to search for truth and evidence. And, again, that's the whole purpose of a worldview is to give credible, uh, verifiable, consistent answers with what we see in reality. Our view of the world, our intellectual framework as we see it, matches up. It corresponds to reality, and that gives it its strength. So getting into the questions specifically that you asked, I asked 18 questions, and uh, you, you made some comment, I think, about how I said it was 18 and it wasn't 18. Let me just list them for you briefly. I asked you to please explain the origin of the universe, the origin of the fine-tuning mathematically, fine-tuning terrestrially, in other words, the Earth, fine-tuning biologically, and fine-tuning informationally. I also asked you to explain, on your worldview of atheism and naturalism, the origin of mathematical laws, logical laws, and physical laws, the origin of the first life or cell, the origin of human reasoning, human consciousness, and the origin of objective morality. And then also uh, to explain ultimate meaning, value, and purpose on atheism. And then also uh, the livability, compatibility, and logical nature of your own worldview. And if you do count those up, it does happen to be 18. So I don't know if you got confused there or whatever the case was, but it, it was 18 actual questions uh, that I posed. And out of the 18, uh, you, I think you tried to answer nine of them, but you only gave kind of a decent answer to a handful. So out of the 18, you only went for nine. And out of the nine, you only really gave kind of a decent answer uh, to a couple of them. So I'd encourage you to, to read through the rest of them, listen to it again. And I know I did talk quite a bit on that video, but just try to give uh, a more thorough answer to more of the questions. So just quickly here, on the origin of the universe, you said, I don't know. Science is working on it. So I find that just kind of um, interesting because your other atheist friends and comrades, they would say, we do know. Because atheists do claim uh, from the Big Bang, the origin of the universe is out of nothingness from a point of infinite density and dimensionless space known as the singularity, etc. And so even atheists that I have spoken with and do converse with, they have a claim to knowledge about the origin of the universe. But yet you yourself subscribe to a worldview, and it appears that you don't even know, you know what that answer to that question is. So I'd encourage you to do some more research on that. You said science is working on it. Well, actually... Naturalistic science claims to have discovered it. So, And there are some things about the Big Bang that I do agree with, that I do hold to. Uh, you went on to ask, well, then who created God? Um, and anytime anybody asks that question, they just merely betray the fact that they don't understand the concept of God. Because asking who created God is, is basically saying this, who created the uncreated? Or who caused the uncaused? It's the equivalent of saying, why is a circle round? Why is a square square? Why does a triangle have three sides? Within the definition of those shapes, um, those things are true by definition about those geometric shapes. And so within the concept of God, um, and maybe it's not true, but within the concept of God, um, it, is, it is true by definition that he is uncaused because if he had a cause, he wouldn't be God. Uh, if he had a maker himself, well, then he wouldn't be 
uh, the maker. And if he was created, he wouldn't be the creator. So uh, you're a little confused as to the concept of God um, that you're appealing to. It's not the classic conception. It's certainly not the biblical idea of God. So I'd encourage you to address that. Um, you said there's no evidence for God. Well, obviously there must be some evidence or guys like me are just, just flat out lying. And for millennia of years, uh, all the Islamic, Jewish, and Christian thinkers, uh, where are they getting all this stuff? So there is clearly a lot of evidence. Maybe you're not familiar with it. So I do encourage you to investigate the cosmological argument from contingency, the koan cosmological argument, uh, the cosmological argument from motion, uh, the moral argument, the design argument, the conceptual argument, uh, the design argument, if I didn't say that one already, the ontological argument for God's existence, and then even uh, the argument for God's existence pertaining to the historical facts surrounding the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Um, there's great evidence, tremendous evidence for the Christian worldview. There is more substantial, verifiable evidence for the Christian worldview, whether it's empirically or philosophically, than for any other worldview that exists out there. And if you don't agree with that, that's fine, but then you need to just wrestle with that and look at the evidence and try to debunk it or disprove it one argument at a time but there certainly is mountains and mountains of evidence to say that is just either uninformed or it's just not honest uh, you said the origin of the universe the answer to that question is not needed for a valid worldview um, well I would disagree I think for your worldview to be valid and for your worldview to be good you definitely do need that and uh, if you don't have that question, it's just not a powerful worldview at all. It's not really an explanation. It's just really a non-answer. And that seems to be a lot of what you said. You just gave a lot of non-answers, actually, in many of your responses. So and that, that, for me, is one reason why so many of the non-Christian worldviews, they're just unacceptable because that's what they boil down to, non-answers and non-explanations. Uh, the origin of the universe, you said that's a scientific quest. Well, I would say, number one, uh, that quest... Uh, has been completed in a sense with the board guth vilenkin theorem in 2003, uh, standard Big Bang cosmology. Um, scientifically speaking, a lot of great answers have already been achieved there, and so um, some really good work has already been done and completed. But also it goes beyond just a scientific quest because um, the science itself, which, which pertains only to the physical world and universe, could never explain the complete origin of the physical universe and reality. It has to go beyond science. And this, of course, is where you get into philosophy uh, and or theology. And so science itself could never give a complete uh, explanation of the origin of the physical universe because the explanation goes beyond the realm of science itself. And if you misunderstand that, then you need to do some investigation into philosophy. And uh, science itself is standing upon philosophical assumptions, just so you know that. Uh, and without philosophy, science wouldn't even be possible. So anyway, then you go on to say that you have to provide an explanation. You're right. I do have to provide an explanation. And I do. And what about you? You don't provide an explanation. You just say, I don't know. So again, I would encourage you not to have a double standard. Um, I have, I do provide an explanation as you look on my website, uh, the Kalam cosmological argument, cosmological argument from contingency, moral argument, design argument, conceptual argument, etc. Uh, I do provide uh, an explanation, and I believe it's a very, very good and plausible explanation. Uh, but yet, you yourself don't seem to hold up to the same standard that you would like to hold the Christian worldview to. So that was your answer to that question. You said, I don't know. Next question, fine-tuning of the universe, you just just deny it. You say it isn't finely tuned. And again, I, I would just encourage you to, to really get in touch with the research that's being done in this field. Uh, it is finely tuned, and the intelligent atheists that are out there, the academics and scholars, they understand this, and for them, it is a very big problem. Uh, they call it the Goldilocks universe, the Goldilocks uh, situation, the Goldilocks context of our Milky Way galaxy because uh, it's, it's brought about what's called the anthropic principle, how um, conditions of the universe mathematically, um, biologically, and you know, terrestrially, etc., do happen to be finely tuned and designed for not just life but complex biological life to appear. But you just flat out deny that, so it just shows me that you must be out of touch with good scholarship and good reading. Um, biologically, you say that evolution isn't random or accidental. Um, well, I would say some people would disagree with you that it, it is absolutely random and by chance. 
Um, but even other people, like Francisco Ayala, who says that um, evolution is a guided process, if, revolu if evolution is not random, then if it's guided and if it has some kind of a telos or purpose within it, then this opens up the door for God and evolution to be um, kind of harmoniously combined in there. And though I don't agree that to be that that is true, I don't agree that evolution is true, at least macroevolution, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, but if evolution were true, and let's just pretend that it was or pretend that it is, if evolution is true or were true, God would have to exist for evolution to be able to even begin to come about within the universe because of the fine-tuning of the initial conditions of the universe, the fine-tuning of the laws of physics, and the fine-tuning of biological systems. So much of this, almost all of it, is outside the realm of evolution. So before evolution could even begin to be started, that only begins at first life, uh, the first cell. Before that, uh, so much fine-tuning is already on the table that uh, it would require God's existence anyway. So I'd encourage you to do some more research there. You go on to say microevolution and macroevolution is the same thing. Um, why would macroevolution and microevolution, why would micro and macro be the same thing um, if they're using different words? Macro and micro obviously are, are talking about different things. So macroevolution, properly understood, is evolution at the large scale, and microevolution is what they call evolution at the minor scale. I think a better word for it is adaptability, um, small-scale changes. Macroevolution is large-scale changes, which usually is considered to be speciation. There is tremendous evidence from microevolution, changes within a species and biological adaptation based upon genetic variability, you know, the variability of genetic information that's already present in the organism, like Darwin's finches. Well, they're not Darwin's. They're just the finches of the Galapagos Islands. Their beaks can change or uh, bacterial resistance can, can increase and so forth. But never have we witnessed speciation, one species of animal turning into a completely different species of animal, and that's macroevolution. So, but just the basic comment that you made, macro and microevolution are the same, is just patently, blatantly false and uninformed. You said Christianity is the God of the gaps argument. Um, absolutely not at all. Uh, we, we are seeking to um, find good and rational explanations based upon science and history, etc. And wherever it does point to God, um, we follow the evidence wherever it leads. And so, for example, there's at least five ways scientifically that we know the universe had a beginning. And those five ways, uh, the second law of thermodynamics, the universe expanding, radiation, heat, um, the galaxial matter formations, and E equals MC squared, these five aspects of science are purely scientific by nature, but they point to the fact that the universe had a beginning out of nothingness. But that has theological implications. So we do not employ God of the gaps type arguments. Maybe you've met some other folks that have, but I, don't, I certainly don't do that. Um, so there's scientific information, let's say, and it is raw science, but then it has theological implications. Well, that's not a God of the gaps argument. God of the gaps is just saying, uh, we don't know what it is, so it's God. I actually think that you employ chance of the gaps uh, arguments because you don't know and you just say chance or you just say randomness or you just say evolution. And so uh, most of the responses on the video that you made for me were I don't know, um, just this claim of ignorance, and, and therefore you just stuck in you know, chance or atheism or whatever. And so I think actually that atheists are, are more guilty of any, than anybody than employing a, a kind of a gaps argument. Um, so another question you sought to answer but didn't was the origin of the mathematical laws. You gave no answer to this. You gave no answer. You just said, show me evidence. Um, what would you like to see evidence for? That there are mathematical laws of the universe? Um, that seems to be quite obvious. There's mathematical constants. Whether it's the cosmological constant, the, uh, the gravitational force, the equations that equal gravity, um, general theory of relativity, special theory of relativity, uh, but even just um, mathematical equations themselves, you didn't even bother to answer the question about the laws of logic, um, which those seem to be quite obvious, and even if you disagree with them, you're using them to disagree with them. So there certainly are um, laws of math and laws of logic, um, and you didn't give me an answer, and you just wanted me to show you evidence um, 
they do exist, and you just kind of dodge the question. So I encourage you to address that if you get a chance to. Um, I asked you the question about first life. You, you didn't give me you didn't give me any answer about explaining how non-living chemicals could form into the first living organism, the first cell. Um, you didn't give me any real answer for that. All you said is life isn't special. Really? Life isn't special? Again, I would encourage you to share that with your 12,000 viewers and anybody else who's watching this, that you, as an atheist, believe that life isn't special. And, and that's probably the reason why um, the atheistic worldview allows for um, – not that you would do this yourself, because I know that you probably never would. You seem like a very, very nice person. But this is why the atheistic worldview as a belief system, it allows for massacring people. Because on atheism, you're right. Life isn't special. Uh, but what I, would, what I would challenge you with is that though you say that with your mouth, if you really do believe that with your heart, you are consistent with your atheism. And I applaud you for that. Um, but life does seem to be special to most of us, that life does have a sacred value. And even your family members, your relatives, your friends, uh, I think that in your own life you would disagree with that statement that life isn't special. But it still isn't answering my question. How do you explain the origin of the first cell of first life? You said that life is only chemical interactions. Um, you said there's nothing special about life at all. Um, and then you also said that I'm not comfortable when something is too complicated. Uh, I, I love complication. I love design because design – shows a designer absolutely when there's specified complexity and improbability an amazing complex irreducible design it obviously points to an informational engineer and designer uh, and i know him to be god but in terms of you saying here that life is only chemical interactions then what you're saying is that love is a chemical that free will and choice are a chemical um and again, I, I really just don't think that you believe that. Number one, um, that's not the case empirically. It's not been proven, and I don't think that you believe that yourself uh, because I'm sure you love people. I'm sure you love your friends. You love – I think you mentioned your niece uh, or some younger uh, child in your family. I'm sure that you really love them. And if, if love is just a chemical, if, if life is just chemical interactions, um, how do you explain those aspects of humanity? then that means there really is no such thing as love. There is no such thing as any type of morality, not even subjective morality or objective morality. Um, and then if life is only chemicals interacting, well, then how come interacting chemicals aren't alive? I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. That's not how we would define uh, life, I think, in the vast majority of, of situations. So how come when we, when we make chemicals interact, they don't come to life? How come we don't see spontaneous generation happen? How come we don't see non-living chemicals spontaneously form into life today? Um, Louis Pasteur, the father of bacteriology, who also was a very committed Christian man, um, he disproved spontaneous generation. Uh, but yet so many atheists uh, still seem to be ignorant of this fact. But uh, life is definitely more than just chemical interactions. You're more than just a bag of chemicals. You happen to be a very special creature that you are a part physical and chemical, but you are also mental and I would also say there's an aspect, an aspect of you that is spiritual. But nonetheless, you didn't answer the question, and that's the whole point. You didn't answer the question, how did first life get here? Regarding human reasoning, you just said that um, morality and, and ethics are different. Um, again, I, I don't really understand what, what that means in, in, in reference to the question. Again, you didn't answer the question, how do you explain the origin or the birth or the rise of human reasoning from non-living matter. How does a pile of dirt all of a sudden have the, the capability to reason and to use rationale? Uh, then in terms of the, the question, what is the origin of consciousness? You said that all we are is physical brains and that you dismiss it. Um, well, again, you didn't answer the question. How did a physical brain attain consciousness? What is it? Uh, why is it here? And again, I would, I would encourage you to do some more reading as to fellow atheists and fellow non-theists because they do believe in, in something like consciousness and self-reflection and reason and so forth. And of course, you have consciousness. I wouldn't dismiss it. And you have reason because we're reasoning right now. Um, you also said this, to value human life above a rock is arrogant. Wow. 
Again, this is a very dangerous thing because, you know, you are being consistent with atheism, but if you think like that, then it's no wonder that atheist dictators like Stalin, Lenin, and Mao Zedong were able to massacre over 100 million people in this century alone. Not that you would ever do that because you as a person, I believe, are nice and that you never would do such a thing. But the belief system, the set of ideas that atheism subscribes to allows for that. And you know this right here, your statement, to value human life above a rock is arrogant. Well, if that be true and you apply that on a global scale, then human life has no value. And that is surely very, very dangerous. Um, you said that we can't know this objectively. I would disagree. I think that it is objectively true. In other words, for all people at all places at all time, that the life of a precious baby is much more valuable than a human rock, or than a, a rock, a non-living rock. That a human child, a human baby, is much more value than a non-living object like a rock. I think you can uh, know that objectively. All people at all places at all time, including yourself, I think that you do and would believe in that in the right circumstances. But then, even though you say it's arrogant, I would say, so what? If there is no God, if there is no objective morality, who cares if anybody's arrogant? Who cares if anybody is prideful or mean or whatever the case? Because on your worldview, since there is no objective morality, so what if, if a person is arrogant? You see, that sword cuts both ways. You could never... Uh, you could never fault anybody for being arrogant or for being mean because on your worldview, there is no such thing as, as objective moral values and so forth. Um, so it doesn't, have to, it doesn't have to do with being arrogant or humble or anything like that. It has to do with truth value. What is the truth value of ideas? So please try to give me a response for the origin of human reason and consciousness and mathematical life and first life because you gave me no answer for those questions. You dodged the question and you gave me these other distracting answers and this is known as a red herring. When they used to go hunting with dogs, they would, they would uh, pull a red herring, a fish, across the path so the scent would confuse the dogs and take them off in another direction. So what you're offering are just red herrings to distract the issue. You still didn't answer those questions. Please answer them. You also said that we don't all value humans more. Um, who is we? Uh, it seems like a confused answer to me. Uh, we don't all value humans more. And then you said the value of human life isn't objective. It's not as important as you think. Again, I believe that your thinking in this area is tremendously alarming. Uh, even though you are consistent with atheism, if you can sit there and say the value of human life is an objective and we're not as important as you think, I would encourage you to look into the eyes of of the smallest young child in your life that has value to you, be it your niece or your nephew or your own daughter or something like that, and, and see if you can tell them that. Tell them that you're not as important as you think, kid. Tell them that, uh, you know, the value of your life, it's not really true, it's not really objective. And I really don't think that you believe that to be true. Uh, I think we have a very strong sense, objectively, all people do, that the value of human life is tremendous and it is much more valuable than a rock, than a mosquito, uh, than animals. So, again, that for me just adds more weight on the scale as to why the atheistic worldview is unacceptable, morally speaking, because those kind of moral viewpoints as to the value of human life um, are really dangerous. And you're right that on atheism, life has no value, none at all, no more than anything else. Uh, but, you know, I really don't think that you believe that. I really don't think you live that out consistently. And I also think that, objectively speaking, uh, we would disagree with that as humans uh, because we can't objectively know that life is valuable. Uh, okay, so on the question of morality, you said the question of morality, you said there's no answer uh, regarding origins. Um, you don't have an answer regarding the origins of morality. It only has practical value. Again, you're not answering the question. You're just dodging it. Um, there's other atheist thinkers who do try to give a good answer, and that's what I was hoping for from yourself, so try to give a good answer there as well. And it's not just about the practical value, because, because I could have something that serves me practically of value, and it's pragmatic, it's useful, but if it's not based upon truth, if it's not based upon reality, um, then it's not, it's not really of substance. Unless you're a person that doesn't care about truth, when, and if that's the case, if you just want to go ahead and 
and uh, admit that, then we don't even need to talk. But if you do value truth, if truth does exist, then morality must be something more than just practical value. It's not just about things that are normative or practical. It has to do with the way reality really is and based upon truth. You say there is no objective moral law. It can always be denied. You said that nothing, there's nothing that says raping, killing, and eating my family is wrong. Wow. I would encourage you to say that to your family, to say that if I raped and killed and ate you guys, it wouldn't really be wrong. And uh, if you guys did that to me, it wouldn't be wrong. I would encourage you to walk around the city and say that. And, uh, you know, that just won't get you very far. Uh, we do trust our physical perceptions about the external world. We also need to trust our moral perceptions. There is at least one thing that I believe all humans can agree upon is objectively morally wrong. Torturing little children for fun. At all people, for all places, at all time, that is objectively morally wrong. And so um, there is a lot that says the law says it's wrong. And the reason the law says it's wrong is because it's based upon actually uh, biblical commands. But it's also based upon human moral law. And, of course, if there is a moral law, the only place that could come from is a moral law giver. So this is known as the, the moral argument for God's existence. If there is at least one thing in reality, one objective moral law, just one, then God exists. Because only God is sufficient to explain the existence of any objective moral law. And there is at least one thing that all people and all places at all times agree upon. That it is always wrong to torture and eat little children for fun. If that's truly objective for all people at all places at all time, then God must exist. Because only God, uh, who is eternal, unchangeable, immutable, and beyond the world, is sufficient to ground and to be the source of a foundation for such a moral law that also uh, is transcendent and looks down upon us and, and, and bears down upon all people at all places and all time. So if there is a moral law, there is a moral law giver. I think it's scary that you can say that there is no objective moral law. It can always be denied. And that nothing can say that raping, killing, eating my family is wrong. Again, the atheist worldview allows for gross immorality to happen. Not that you yourself would ever do it. I'm sure you never would. But you have admitted as much that the atheist worldview um, allows for immoral behavior um, and, and you know, basically moral massacres and genocide and so forth. And so as a belief system, it, it, it sanctions that. Even if you don't practice it, that's fine. I appreciate you don't practice it, but your belief system sanctions it. The Christian system, on the other hand, does not. Jesus said, love your enemies. Do good to those that hurt you. And, uh, you know, the golden rule, uh, which basically is don't do unto others what you don't want them to do to you, that's not Christianity because that's just in the negative. The Christian version, uh, it's not the golden rule. It's, it's not don't do unto others. It's do unto others what you want them to do for you. Buddha, Gandhi, Muhammad, nobody, not even Confucius said that. Only Jesus of Nazareth framed it that way. But I do find it scary here that you say that nothing is wrong with raping, killing, or eating your family. Um, it's only opinion. Wow, I sure hope you don't change your opinion. I sure hope that atheist uh, dictators and, and uh, rulers of atheistic regimes don't change their opinion. Because according to you, uh, there's nothing wrong if they... If they uh, rape, kill, and eat their families. In terms of ultimate meaning, value, and purpose, you said there is no ultimate meaning, no ultimate value, no ultimate purpose to life. You said those are only sub subjective opinions, and just because it's comforting doesn't make it true. Oh, you're right. You're right. Just because something is comforting or disturbing doesn't make it true, but you say there's only subjective opinions. Um, well, that's interesting. You just admitted to all of your 12,000 viewers that there's no ultimate meaning to their life, no ultimate value to them as people, and no ultimate purpose for their living. Do you really believe that about yourself? Do you really believe that about all of your viewers? It seems that we have a strong sense that there is definitely objective value, at least one thing. There is objective meaning and purpose to life, to the universe, um, and again, I just do think that that merits investigation because 
Uh, at least you're honest, Bionic Dance. I got to give you that. In this area, at least you're being honest. On atheism, it is only subjective, and it is only an opinion. It is only a personal preference. Um, but again, I don't think that you're consistent. I don't think in your life you really believe that to be true. There are some things that I, I do think you believe are objectively true and objectively false, and uh, it's really hard to swallow that there is no ultimate meaning, value, or purposelessness in life. Because if we really believe that consistently, we would live a lot differently. We would go through this world not caring anything about anybody, and we would get, get, get ours while the getting is good, and I'm sure you don't live like that. And it's because we do have a sense that there is ultimate uh, meaning in life, ultimate value in life, and ultimate purpose. Not just subjectively, but objectively. Not just temporarily, but ultimately. Uh, there really are those things. At least according to the Christian worldview, there are. And I would encourage you to think about this. If God does exist, then there is ultimate meaning. There is ultimate value. And there is ultimate purpose in life. If God doesn't exist, well, then there really is none. And that is very, very scary. But again, if God does exist, then there is ultimate meaning, ultimate value, ultimate purpose in life. Because it's anchored in God and in his purposes. So again, the question comes down to researching the the truth value, the evidence of the statement, God exists. Arguments for God's existence, philosophically, scientifically, historically, and I, I didn't hear you talk about any of that, so I'd encourage you to do that. And then, is your worldview livable? Uh, you just gave me naked denials, no answers. Uh, you didn't really try to give me explanations or answers, just naked denials. You said if something is livable, it's not important to the truth value. Well, in a sense, you're right, because if something is livable or unlivable, um, it's not true necessarily, but the livability of something is a valuable test for a worldview. It is a valuable test for a worldview. So again, I would just encourage you to comment on that. Is your worldview livable? Why or why not? Because um, livability doesn't directly uh, impact the truth value of something. But it is a valuable test because, of course, we do want life to have um, some type of meaning, value, and purpose. We don't want life to be absurd and despairing. And if, and if life really is like that, well, we certainly don't reflect it in the way that we live. So it does happen to be an interesting test to put your worldview through. Is your worldview livable? A couple more you said here at the end of your video. There is no absolute truth. Are you absolutely sure about that? Let me say that again. You said there is no absolute truth. And I ask you, are you absolutely sure about that? You just made an absolute statement that there is no absolute truth. So you see, um, any other opinion, any other approach that tries to deny absolute truth is self-defeating. So there is absolute truth. It does really exist. You would ought to say there is no absolute morality. Um, I would ask you then, why do you get upset? If people come against your lifestyle, your personal morality, your personal beliefs, and they call you insulting names and derogatory comments, why do you get upset? Because I can tell that you do. Why would you get upset? If there is no such thing as absolute morality, why would you get upset? Why do you even bother? Why do you pass moral judgments on people if there is no such thing as absolute morality? If, and, and, and as I said before, if there is at least one thing that is absolutely morally true – then there must be a moral law giver. If there is at least one absolute moral law, such as it is always wrong for all people at all places at all times to torture and eat little children for fun, if there is at least one moral law like that that is true, then there is a moral law giver. But you say there is no absolute morality. I ask you, well, then why are you so upset? Why, why are you upset at people and why are you passing moral judgments on people for them passing moral judgments? Because you say there is no absolute morality. Um, and again, if there is no absolute truth, do you not believe in love and goodness and beauty? I bet you probably do. I bet you probably do with your friends, with your family, with your relatives. I bet you do believe in such a thing as beauty, such a thing as goodness, such a thing as love. I bet you do. But if what you say is right, if there is no absolute universal truth, in other words, something that is true for all people at all places at all times, whether they believe it or not or know it or not, or accept it or not, it's absolutely true. Well, if that's not the case, there's no love, there's no goodness, there's no beauty. And then you said that atheists 
atheism means that theists are full of blank, um, that's just no answer to atheism's knowledge claim. You know, atheism, the, the word atheism, atheos, is just is a positive knowledge claim. It is a positive belief statement. Again, consult the Cambridge Dictionary of Philosophy. I have it in my library, and it is a secular book, not written by Christians, and it says that atheism is the positive claim to knowledge that God doesn't exist. The positive belief that God doesn't exist. And if it's a positive claim to knowledge, you have the burden of proof. You need to demonstrate it. You need to bring forth evidence to verify that truth claim. And again, here, you're just kind of being derogatory and you are not giving an answer uh, to your claim to knowledge. You then also go on. At the very end of your video, I just made some interesting observations. Uh, you said at the end of your video in your little slogan, quote, if it can't be in your hand, it's all in your head. If it can't be in your hand, it's all in your head. Did you know that's a self-defeating statement? If it can't be in your hand, it's all in your head. Can that statement be in your, in your hand? Can the truth of that statement, can that be in your hand? In other words, what you're basically ascribing to there is what you call verificationism or scientism. It used to be called in the olden days logical positivism. And I encourage you to do some research into these uh, if you get a chance. These are logically self-defeating philosophies. Verificationism and logical positivism died out because the atheists finally realized those were self-defeating ideas. Scientism itself is also self-defeating. It's, it's very similar to what you said. If something cannot be expressed in the language of chemistry or biology or physics, then it's not, it's not a, a valid source of knowledge about reality. If it can't be expressed in biology, physics, or chemistry, it tells us nothing. Well, guess what? That sentence cannot itself be expressed in the language of science or, or biology or physics or chemistry, so it fails to meet its own standard. And it is, is by definition, self-defeating. So when you say at the end of your videos, if it can't be in your hand, it's all in your head, well, you know what? Uh, that idea, that statement, that truth cannot itself be in your hand, so your atheism must all be in your head by your own, by your own admission here. It's a self-defeating idea. So you are standing upon some ideas, a lot of ideas that are based upon ignorance, that are based upon chance of the gaps arguments, and upon self-defeating statements. Um, and then finally, you said at the end, don't go on automatic Think. I think that's what it says on the little shirt you were wearing. Don't go on automatic. Think. Bionic Dance, I really appreciate you. I really think that you're a really interesting person and you got great video skills. But you know what? I'd encourage you to follow your own advice. Don't go on automatic. Think. There are things that you subscribe to that are not explained by your atheistic worldview. And also, uh, you didn't answer all the 18 questions, so it seems that your worldview lacks explanatory power. And out of the nine questions that you did seek to answer, most of the answers you gave were, I don't know. I don't know. It appears to me you're more agnostic than atheist. I'd encourage you to think about that. And even the answers that you did give, did try to give, didn't really address the question. So... I thank you so much for your time, Bionic Dance. I encourage you to make another uh, video response. I'd love to keep talking with you. And I encourage you, 12,000 viewers and subscribers of Bionic Dance, to think about the atheistic worldview. There is a great book uh, by the title, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, by Frank Turek and Norman Geisler. I'd encourage you to check it out. Um, I myself, I don't have enough blind confidence, blind faith, and uh, blind trust to be an atheist. I value logic and good thinking, philosophy, evidence, and proof. And therefore, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist or a naturalist or a materialist. Um, since I do value evidence and proof and philosophy and thinking and evidence, um, I have to go with the Christian worldview because it explains more features of reality than any other worldview, any other philosophy that's out there. Anybody who sees this, I encourage you to uh, listen to the 18 questions. Send me a video response. You can email me at jason at claycup.com. You can check out our website at intelligentfaith315.com. Or you could just post a video to the YouTube channel uh, that you're probably watching right now. I'd love to talk to any of you guys. Uh, let's just have a, a polite, civilized discussion and interaction. And I do encourage you to search for the evidence whether it's scientific, philosophical, historical, and follow it wherever it leads. Till next time.
have an intelligent faith. 